Well, thanks. Uh, I know. I apologize if some of you have seen some of my presentation before. I, re I recognize some faces out there, but uh, we'll go ahead with what I've got anyway. Uh, this picture, actually, uh, Matt was asking me about it, is right across the creek here from last spring, uh, where we had an incredibly warm uh, spring. Uh, the rye, that's the cereal rye, started growing in early March. I wouldn't let it get this big uh, and then come and try to plant corn, but uh, for our research plots, uh, that's what we let it go. And as I said, I've worked mostly with cover crops with the cereal cover crops. Uh, this is a picture of rye. Um, from Northeast Iowa, Alamakee County. And then this is uh, oats that we overseeded or interseeded into soybeans at leaf drop. Uh, this picture again, <coughs> right across the creek here. Uh, that barn is no longer there, but, uh, uh, and that's in November. So oats uh, will winter kill, but in most falls they'll go till about Thanksgiving or the first week in December before they, they finally get killed. And that's very good growth for oats. Uh, that's probably the best we ever had. Matt talked about this a little bit, but you know, what is it that cover crops are doing or why are we growing cover crops? Well, uh, you know, and why do we have so much nitrogen and phosphorus in our streams? Well, basically we went from a system where Iowa was covered with perennial vegetation, forests, prairies, or whatever. So we always had plants out there all year round. We took that ground and now we're well over 95% corn and soybeans or continuous corn. Uh, on a large percentage of our acreage. I think actual uh, percentages are around 90% in most counties. And so now we have essentially seven months of the year where we don't have any living plants out there. And this gets back to the whole uh, thing about, well, why are we losing so much nitrogen? And this is part of it. Part of it's tile drainage, part of it's tillage, Part of it's applying nitrogen fertilizer. There's a lot of reasons, but this is another one that fits into that category of the, what's caused this change in the amount of nutrients we see in our streams. And the thing about cover crops, as we kind of talked about it, it doesn't only affect, or they don't only affect phosphorus and nitrogen, but they also uh, reduce erosion increase soil organic matter, and then also affect the biology of the system. And here again, it's just by having a living plant out there rather than an annual corn and soybeans where we don't have anything, and in many cases, bare soil for that period of time. This is just kind of a laundry list of the, the things that cover crops can do shown in different research across the country. Uh, as Matt mentioned, Bob Hartzler's doing something or a little bit with improved weed control and glyphosate resistant weeds. Uh, this is getting a lot more interest uh, in that again by having plants out there we're, we're changing our soil organisms uh, in you know the small arthropods, uh, worms, uh, we pretty typically see uh, an increase in earthworm populations in fields where we have cover crops. We're improving soil structure, especially in no-till. Um, one of the things like in South America, no-till is almost always done with cover crops. Uh, and it's kind of a, a synergy there that uh, no-till lets you have more time so that you can put cover crops in. But on the other hand, cover crops can improve how no-till performs. Uh, a lot of farmers, especially in practical farmers of Iowa that are still uh, growing cattle are using cover crops for grazing and forage potential. And there again, there's a synergy in that uh, cover crops are a good thing to couple with manure applications to save some of that nitrogen 
and phosphorus that we have with manure application. One of the first things that we did and one of the first reasons we got uh, into cover crops in uh, around 1990 uh, was at that time soybeans grown on highly erodible acres and we did some erosion measurements over three years on a no-till soybean field which was again right across the creek from here on about a four and a half uh, percent slope. And these are just some pictures that I uh, cut apart. We did rainfall simulation and we did these measurements in April. These, this is no-till without a cover crop. You can see the soybean residue. Here's an oat cover crop which has been winter killed so you can't see it but the dead oat plants are still holding that soybean residue in place. And then here's with the rye cover crop. So we started out with a situation we made both rainfall and then uh, water additions for overland water flow. And essentially with both what we call rill and inner rill erosion, we saw about a 50% reduction in erosion over what we got from being in no-till. Uh, with the rye cover crop, about a 25% reduction with the oat cover crop. And here where we had uh, no cover crop, we were getting about uh, two tons of soil loss calculated on an annual basis. I got this picture from a farmer in Washington County, Iowa that uh, plants about 2,000 acres of rye cover crops. Uh, this is his farm up here. Uh, he uses a lot of good practices. He's been in no-till since the 1970s, or his father was. Uh, they have terraces, and you can see the cover crop. Uh, last April, they had about a three and a half inch rain overnight. Uh, we're having a lot more of those kind of events. His neighbor, has also been long-term no-till. They got this picture from Google Earth uh, taken uh, shortly after, well, I don't know how that works actually, but he got it from Google Earth. And you can see here in his neighbor's no-till field uh, with soybean residue, a lot of real erosion happened you know, with that rainfall event. Uh, this is a guy that's doing good conservation practices, it wasn't tilled, and still had pretty erosive events, and you don't really see any evidence of that over here. And you can say it's a combination of practices because he does have terraces also. But that's what it, all of these things are going to take is a combination of practices. The other thing, and Matt talked a lot about this, nitrate loss in tile drainage. Uh, this is the uh, results for, I guess that's nine years uh, from our study just north of Highway 30 here uh, in central Iowa. And in our study there where we've had uh, corn soybean rotation uh, and corn soybean with a rye cover crop, over those nine years we saw a 53% reduction in uh, loss in terms of uh, pounds per acre of nitrogen. And I, I didn't bring the graph, but we're losing nitrogen in both the corn and the soybean years. Uh, even we're losing nitrogen in years that we don't apply any nitrogen fertilizer, uh, which again goes to show that uh, it's not just nitrogen fertilizer. Um, our tile spacing in this particular uh, field is a hundred feet apart, uh, so narrower than what farmers would have, but uh, still a respectable uh, distance. Now, 53% is different than uh, the number in the nutrient reduction strategy. Uh, that's not a, a big re surprise. Uh, you're going to have a different number depending on where you have the study. We're, ours is here in the Des Moines lobe on a high organic matter soil. Uh, you know, we have 210 to 220 bushel corn, you know, 60 to 70 bushel beans. Uh, 
someplace else on a poorer soil, less productive, you're going to have different numbers. It also depends on when your drainage occurs or how much drainage we have. Within these nine years, uh, we had the five wettest consecutive years in, on record. Uh, the five-year total was the highest in the, the 60 years they've kept uh, weather records. Is it going to continue that way? Well, no, didn't last year. Uh, but we are in a different cycle than we were years ago. Uh, Matt mentioned that most of our drainage comes in April, May, and June. That's probably still true, but in these nine years, we also got a lot of drainage during January, December, and November, which never happened before, as, or we haven't seen it, or at least since I started doing research in, since 81. So things are different, um, and we don't know where they're going to go from here. But anyway, a 53% reduction here. Uh, other places, you're going to have a different amount. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what? Most of the nitrate taken up by the cover crop fall or spring. And second of all, how 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 large do we need to let the rye go in the spring to get these benefits before we kill it? Right. In a true cover crop situation. I guess the the short answer is I don't know. Um, we we know how much nitrogen the cover crop takes up in its shoots, um, and it roughly mirrors the amount of nitrogen reduction that we see in the tile drainage. In other words, we know it's taken up uh, 50 pounds in dry matter, then it will, over time, see about a 50% reduction. But one thing we have with these tiles spaced that far apart, we know that there's a lag between the time that the rye takes up the nitrogen and the time we see the benefit in the drainage. There's some that happens right away, but we think sometimes like if we have a big rye growth, we can see the effect of that for up to a year later in the tile drainage. So it's kind of an integrated or it, it integrates over time. Uh, because it just takes the nitrate uh, a, a long time to move down vertically and then horizontally through the field to get there. Are these samples taken from tile lines? Yes, they are. So When's your nitrogen being applied here? Our nitrogen, well, we, there's a little bit that goes on with the P and the K in the fall. You know, I don't know, about 20 pounds. But most of our nitrogen is applied at or after planting. So this is not fall applied nitrogen. This is uh, some goes right on with the planter, and then the rest of it is side dressed. Has there been any studies that show the return of nitrogen after the plant has died? And do certain ones, you know, and I know it's all variables as to how much it grows and rain and everything else. But is there certain ones that will actually return more back? I mean, certain <laughs> cover crops. Yeah, definitely the legumes would return more nitrogen back. That's partly because they're fixing nitrogen. It's kind of a balance between increasing soil organic matter and recycling of nitrogen for the next crop. And I know that's so we, we don't have a real good handle on how fast it comes back. I mean, I know that all this nitrogen taken up is eventually going to come back to the soil and the plants. We just can't say uh, when. So I would say it's more. It's better to look at it as a slow release uh, process. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that that we've measured on uh, ground that we've had in cover crops for a long time. Now we're starting to see some of that nitrogen come back. 
but it's not like you can say, oh, the rye cover crop took up 40 pounds of nitrogen. That 40 pounds is going to be available to the next crop because some of it gets recycled into soil organic matter or long-term pools.